Uh, happy Wednesday to everyone. It's uh, the middle of June, uh, July. I'm here in Boise, Idaho, and the world headquarters of Lamla and Lauren. I believe you're in Southern California, the the shaking, rattling, and rolling Southern California. Quite a difference from your previous, uh, you know, northeastern, mm -hmm. western residence. So, uh, welcome today. Thank, thank you. I'm excited to be here, and this topic, one of my absolute favorite topics, Jonathan. Okay, so um, to get us going, I just want to do a few quick things. I'm going to share my screen, um, and we're going to do two things first. I'm going to do a, just a two or three slides intro into the conversation, a little bit about Lean Law, just so we set the table. Then we're going to go right into the meat of the um, of our discussion, and in there, we're also going to have um, uh, we're also going to have a few polls. So I'm going to I'm going to get things going right now um, and share my screen. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay, so um, just a few little things. Um, today, uh, you know, Lauren has uh, joined us and this is our third uh, webinar that we've done together. Um, and so it's really exciting. We're, you know, uh, really fluid with each other and I'm really enjoying um, this conversation and series of conversations we're having. Today is raising rates without losing clients and Lauren's an expert in that. We're gonna get to her background and her expertise in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about what we're gonna cover, um, what our goals are. And this is based on some conversations Lauren and I had in regards to this. Um, and so we're going to say, you know, ask the question, try to answer it. Why is it difficult to raise your, your, your rates? We're going to define the value to price relationship. There's this relationship between the two. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit about having a value conversation with a client. And then lastly, we're going to give you the lawyer's lens of what they think value means. So those are the points, and there's a lot of other scattered or other points to this, um, but those are the, the themes that we want to cover today. Um, a little bit about um, our speakers. Whoops, sorry, I'm trying to use my thing. So here's Lauren. Um, Lauren, why don't we start by just introducing yourself um, and telling the group a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, actually, let's go with the accent first because that's what they care most about. Is it's originally from Brooklyn, New York. I now live in Southern California. So I left Brooklyn when I was six and eventually made it over to Southern California. We just moved here within the last six months, absolutely loving it, aside from the shake, rattle, and roll episodes. Uh, but I will say that I am a sports psychologist turned business coach. What I have seen is that my education has prepared me for doing that thing that I do really well, which is helping individuals really achieve their peak potential to be able to get out of their way, to have the strategies and the tactical steps to really reach their highest potential. That I got from my education, but what my education didn't do is it didn't prepare me to be an entrepreneur, to be a business owner as opposed to be an employee. Because of that, Jonathan, what I realized is I needed to really do that deep dive into how do you have a business that really focuses on value, serves the clients deeply, and supports my lifestyle? Uh, in the beginning, I didn't do that so well. My husband, Steve, and I, we've worked side by side in some capacity since 1982. In 1997, we actually opened up a counseling agency. We had 11 employees together. And over the course of our working together, I burned out because I was working really long hours and we at times weren't making that much money, uh, especially in the beginning. It, I sacrificed so much as far as time with my family, going to sporting events, dinners at night together. And that's when I started looking for that next best thing. I became aware of coaching and not just for athletes, but all the, this whole industry of coaching that popped up that I wasn't aware of in the beginning. And that's when I started to make the transition in 2009 from being a therapist into business coaching. And, and now I'm really so focused on helping entrepreneurs, bookkeepers especially, about how to be able to have a business that focuses on value, you connect with your work and ways to be able to lighten your workload. Uh, the bottom line is, I really love helping entrepreneurs, uh, bookkeepers, accounting professionals to double their income while working half the time. Um, 
Well, that's quite a story. I mean, and I'm going to be much more briefer with my side, which is um, I'm one of the founders and principals here at Lane Law. We started our company in 2015 with the focus on really modernizing how small law firms, and when I mean small law firms, uh, how they invoice, how they manage the life cycle of uh, the financial life cycle of a client. And, you know, what we've, we've brought to market a really vibrant tool with some really nice market adoption. And we, our unique place in the world is how we integrate with QuickBooks and how lean we are. Um, so um, I'm going to just spend, Lauren, just so you know, I'm going to spend a few quick slides about lean law just to kind of sure. give people some orientation and then we're going to jump right into it. So um, as I mentioned, Lean Law is a software as a service company. Um, our job is to either read data from QuickBooks or to write to it. And while that facilitating the workflow for small law firms as they handle their finances. Um, and you know, what, what that means is from an accounting person's perspective is that we aspire that you can work in the accounting tool that makes most sense to you i.e. QuickBooks Online, while the lawyers and the legal folks work in a tool that's intuitive to them. The end goal is that you have one clean chart of accounts and there's not a lot of messy or manual work in between the two. Um, so, and I always wanna say this, and I, I, I say this because we've developed this Lean Law Accounting Pro program to create community with our accounting friends and it's been wonderful. I mean, it's really been a huge win for the company and, and for me personally. But it, it stems to this one premise here, which is a constant sort of tension inside our firm, which is attorneys find it difficult to find accounting resources that understand how law firms operate. And so while that's off topic a little bit, I want that to be in the back of your heads because it really is critical because it will play back into the value of the idea of understanding who your client is. And we routinely get attorneys saying, hey, we need help. We need someone who knows it, you know, knows Lean Law, QuickBooks Online, and Law. So I just want you to be checked in. Um, I'm gonna just jump a few little slides. These are always so popular when we speak, so I'm gonna throw them out. Um, there's 1.3 million attorneys in the United States and 68% of them are in small law. That means typically 50 attorneys or less. Um, and they're really broken up into five brackets. Now, the reason I present this is that when you think about your relationship and what you want to offer to a law firm, do you want to work with a solo? Do you want to work with solo plus? It's a principal plus some staff of theirs. Do you want to work with micro law firms, two to four attorneys? Maybe a larger firm that could be a lead principal, meaning there's a lead individual. She can then have a bunch of folks associating, uh, a bunch of associates working for her. Or then the small law firm, which gets into a much different dynamic of compensation and payroll and employee management and whatnot. The last slide I want to show before we're going to drop into the conversation is where Lean Law fits in the grander schematic of law, for, of law firm software. So again, we're invoicing only, and there's really two types of products that do invoicing. Practice management, with Clio being one of the big winners and leaders there. And then on the invoicing side, that's invoicing only. So practice management will have document management, it will have email management, other facets for sort of, in a general way, trying to manage the life cycle of a project matter case, whatever you might call it. Lean Law fits in the invoicing only. Typically, um, these are firms that may have other document management tools and whatnot. And we are by far, and I don't mean to just boast, but we are by far the best integration of anyone on this page as it relates to QuickBooks. That's our niche. And the opportunity is some of these laggards, time slips and PC law in particular, are really aging out and people are shedding. So there's this need to help law firms get out of the old and into the new and QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Advanced is certainly the place that people are interested in. Okay, back to you, Lauren. That just wanted to lay a little framework on the lien law side. So um, let me stop my share. So I'm gonna start with the first question and I, I think it's sort of a doozy now. Oh, I've gotta do my poll. Um, real quick poll. I'm gonna launch this poll and the question is, what motivated you to attend today's meeting? So just a quick little, a little, you know, fill that out and let us know why folks are, are here today. Okay, so the, the, the leading winner is I wanna raise my rates and don't know how. 
by far. There are some people who want to know more about lean law, so I'm glad I, I talked, I spoke to that. Um, this is not meant to be a demo of lean law. We do those weekly and we're happy to help you. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and, and really, uh, and I'm appreciative, people want to know about lean law, but they also want to know how to raise their rates. Um, uh, they want to raise them and they don't know how. Okay, so Lauren, first question. So that point, um, why is it so difficult to raise rates? And and what's the first step that gets folks started? Why is this so difficult on so many levels? I believe that it's difficult because of our beliefs about how you ought to be charging for your services and that sometimes there's conflicting value, um, values where you might have a desire to want to make more money. However, you don't want to be seen as greedy. You don't want to take advantage of other people. Uh, the bottom line is that then it connects with the mindset. When you look at your mindset, the first thing you really want to look at is what is your value and becoming aware of that. And also, as you gain that awareness, what are some of the things that come up in your head when you think about raising your rates? Are there thoughts that hold you back about it's uncomfortable, it feels like a drastic step, will it be fine? Are clients going to leave when I actually need the income? I'm concerned about charging that much because I don't have enough credentials, experience. Nobody else in my category charges that. So that's some of the things that happen. To be aware that when you start having these doubts or reservations that come up when you look at pricing your services, then what happens is you are thinking longer about it, but you're not doing anything about it because you want to avoid those uh, conversations. The only way to be able to work, uh, to be able to earn more with your current pricing system is to work harder. However, the fastest way to really boost your income is by raising your rates. That is the number one fastest way that you can actually earn more money. What I want you to look at is just having an open mind about what are those things that are stopping you? Is there a different way of being able to approach those things that really don't have you compromise some of your core values. And part of what we're going to look at further is how do you set yourself up as that trusted advisor and start to separate your fees from your time because your value actually lies in what you know, not what you do. So what I heard is that like there's this bundle of fear, right? I mean, that's what I, I heard. There's like fear led to all these different components and and so is that like i mean is it is it fear based that people kind of have this sort of inertia around raising rates is it is it really a business kind of mentality like what where do you when you interact with your coaching um clients is it is that like getting at the fear the real crux of it or is there other aspects or attributes that i that 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 really have to be addressed first Jonathan, I believe that anything you want to do with your business is probably freely available on the internet. The strategy, the tactical steps, and the reason that some people do it and some people don't has to do with your belief system as well as uh, your value system. So yes, it's a mindset thing first. It takes courage to raise your rates. No matter what size business someone has from the solopreneur up to even a legacy enterprise business, they all look at raising their rates and there's a lot of times hesitations. I think the other part is people are hesitant to do something that's different from what everybody else is doing. However, they don't even realize how the billable hour came about. It was created by an attorney in the 1800s to justify his rates. And really? I don't know that. That's really the truth. <laughs> it was the attorney yeah. in the 1800s. It was he he gave us all that torture, all the torture of the Bill of Lauer, that guy. Absolutely. Had to somehow justify his rates to his clients. Came up with the billable hour. How, therefore, we think that something is based on logic and set in stone when someone just created it out of thin air to justify the way they were charging their clients the exorbitant fees. Uh, so therefore, it's time to go against what everybody's been doing. The billable hour does not serve people who really have a lot to offer. They're going beyond compliance work, 
and that they are making a really amazing difference for their clients. So, um, Lauren, Gary asked a really interesting question. Yeah. I'm going to give a little antidote to it, but he asked, I don't want to lose clients um, I have to raise from a lower to higher rate. And I'm going to give one antidote from Lean Law, which is Lean Law came out with their early pricing with the idea that, you know, okay, we're going to win clients and do that. And we had a lot of tension because we were under market. Um, we weren't priced right. And so there was a lot of fear, like, are we going to lose clients? And what are clients going to sink? And we went through this whole it's so almost emotional conversation inside the company. And finally, Gary, our CEO, said, we're just doing it, right? And, and I was the, probably the worst culprit because I, I deal with the clients so intimately. And the end was we raised our rates from, you know, almost like 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. And the end of the, the end loss was one client, and it was a bit of a good riddance client. Like, I was like, nah, she's okay to go away because she was, she was difficult. So mm -hmm. the truth is, is that with Lin Law, to your point, I believe, I mean, yes, there was some market pricing, so we had to get equal with the market, so there were some business mm -hmm. mechanics there, but there was a greater value that we were offering on a day in and day out basis that we were underestimating, and there was too much fear built into it. Like, we're actually thinking about how we reshape our pricing now based more on value and being able to communicate that value back to the client and reinforce that value, which is important. Um, so let's, let's get into this next question, which is, because um, we keep talking about this word value, because yeah. um, it's, it's difficult to describe. And, and by the way, if you see me looking right, I have three screens, and so I'm managing the webinar and looking at my notes, so I'm not trying to be uh, dismissive. But um, so, you know, when we look at value, it's difficult to sort of describe, especially related to pricing. So how do you explain this like utopic value to price um, mm -hmm. ratio yep. and relationship? Because that's really the crux of it all, right? I mean, there's some explicit relationship there. Yeah, I will actually explain it. Uh, and it's a very interesting way of looking at it. So say I'm speaking at QuickBooks Connect and in the back of the room, you're thirsty, you want to get water. There's either the water cooler or you can buy a bottle of water from me. And that bottle of water is from Costco. It's the eight ounce size, it's sealed, so on and so forth. It's for a dollar. Uh, and, and then you have a choice. You might pay a dollar for the bottle of water or you might go for the free water from the water cooler. You have an option. Now, if I had that same exact bottle of water, and Jonathan, you've been walking around thirsty in the desert for three days and it's August. You don't know if the next hour you'll be finding your way out of the desert or not because you have no idea where you are. And magically, I appear with that same bottle of Costco water, the eight ounces, it's sealed, same labeling, everything. And you know that you're at the last end of your lifeline. How much would you pay for that same bottle of water? Well, I mean, of course, if it's life or death, I'd give you everything I had uh, okay. um, up to my firstborn. But the, uh, I don't want your firstborn. That's too yeah. much. That's, that's not <laughs> really that valuable to me. So let's yeah. go with a money thing. You know, how much would you be willing to pay? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it would, it, you know, you're right. Under the circumstances, you know, I'd pay you every, I'd pay you, far more than what I would in the other circumstance mm -hmm. because there was more, there was, it, it, one's more of a commodity, the other's more of something that's very mm -hmm. unique and explicit. A absolutely, and, and that's how to under start to understand value is that what I'm offering did not change. What happened is your perceived value of what I'm offering has changed. You have different needs, desires and wants when you're walking around in the desert for three days thirsty than when you're sitting in a conference room listening to me talk. That is really how you start to recognize value is it's not about necessarily what you value with your work uh, because you put a lot of time and effort into it. It's more about what is your client value based upon their needs, wants, and desires and how you can help them achieve those things or fix those things. So let me put that into a legal yeah. example so that Please. so the group can understand it. And I'm sure Devin has this experience. I, I keep going back to Devin because he's got he's so exclusive a lot. Um, so we get a lot of folks that come to Lean Law 
in our deal flow that, oh, she, sorry, um, that come to lean law in the context of we're making change. So they're moving from an environment that could be very antiquated, um, a QuickBooks desktop environment with a tool like PC law or time slips. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, we know we need to change. Now, some of that change might be a server's being removed. Some of that change might be a, a boomer. And this is a trend in law right now that the boomers are aging out, who sort of ran the firm. And now Gen X is coming in, and they feel a lot of pressure from millennials to modernize and to sort of get with it. So they're saying, hey, we need to do this. And so there's this, this, this urgency to change. And so when an, an accounting person can come in in that moment and say, I know how to get you from where you need to go to where you want to be, and not just talk about data migration, but talk about the, the, the overall life cycle of a matter and client financially as it relates to the tools and the platforms of QuickBooks Online, that they can articulate this vision about where you are and how we'll get you there. The value of that in that moment is extraordinary because it's the exact pain point they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. If you come into that same conversation and say, well, we do payroll and we do um, monthly reconciliation and we're, we're, we're pro advisors with QuickBooks and you kind of give that generic conversation and the person next to them gives this, we totally get it. We understand what you're trying to do. Let's talk about the life cycle of your client. We'll talk about tools and really specific things, how you get there, how the phases, how the approach, how we then work with you on a monthly basis. And you kind of map out that, that vision and uh, that strategy. It's, it's entirely contrasted. And I, I can tell you, I've, I've experienced this as I come in and listen to the accounting person. So the value to that firm by understanding the tools, the process, where they want to go, connecting with them is so much higher that then ultimately you can say, and here's my price point. And it's different than that other person who said, well, I, I'm a QBO pro advisor and I know QuickBooks, right? That's totally different and I can do your reconciliation. So that's, that's just something specific that's happening right now. There's other value points with law, and we're going to get to some of that a little bit later about compensation reporting, trust reconciliation, and trust compliance, and things of that nature that are really tangible things that lawyers will value. Okay. Um, so I, maybe I put the cart before the horse there, but... No, no, that, that, that's all good. I'll, I'll just jump in and... You can skip asking the question. Um, it is basically what you're talking about. Is if you're going to do value pricing, which is really focuses on your expertise as opposed to what you do, then in order to be able to do that, you have to know how to do what I call a value conversation. The value conversation really discovers what's important to the client. It's about discovering what their needs are, which are really those basic things that they need to have happen in order to be able to move forward with their business or to be able to remain operational. It's about those uh, wants. The wants are things that they really know that they ought to have and will help them to be able to do their service uh, in a way that's gonna be growth-minded and make things more fluid. And then there's the desires. And the desires are the sweet spot because the desires are the things that they actually would crave to have, but they just don't think that they can have yet. Uh, those are more future focused. Therefore, how do you really start to have that value conversation where you are able to find out their needs, wants, and desires? That's typical for most engagement conversations where you're talking about yourself and you're selling your services. This is about really discovering their needs and then really focusing on how to be able to help them as a trusted advisor to achieve those things that they want as opposed to have them adapt to the compliance piece that you primarily offer. Once again, they're not as interested in what you do. The reporting, the data entry, the uh, tax advantages are definitely important. Let's not minimize that, but it's that overarching of helping them get what they want that brings up, that raises the value of what you have to offer, and once again positions you as a trusted advisor. Yeah, and I think what uh, there's two points I want to kind of probe around a little bit, and the and the first is um, that conversation. So someone you, you sort of you're brought into a conversation with a law firm or any client, 
and you know someone's referred you typically i mean it's, it's they may have found you on the web but in general a trusted referral is what everyone's trying to harvest to win a new customer um you know those that try to win on search and other things it's a really challenging way to do lead development so you've come in as a trusted advisor someone said hey go meet lauren she's fabulous right so the question becomes, and I want to, I want to just throw a little bit around this idea. Sure. And you said this, this, and I think it's really important. You said, instead of telling them what you want them to hear, you're listening and, and trying to understand what you can do for them. I, I may not be saying that totally correctly, but I think in sales, we sometimes get caught up in what we want them to hear versus what, you need to hear to help them get to where they want to go. And I guess I want you to speak a little bit to the idea of listening versus speaking and not just telling, you know, the standard story, but really trying to, how do you probe in and what are those tactics to have a really successful interaction with that client? And, and, and Jonathan, what I really believe is that similar to having workflows with how you manage a client on a month-to-month -month basis. This is about having a system or workflow on how to really go through the process from someone first reaching out to you to getting signed on to work with you if it's a match. What I look at is that you have to earn the right to talk about your services. They, they need to know first that you care about them and what matters to them before they're going to ask you how this works. But if you ask the exact right questions, then they're going to ask you how this works because they understand that you get it by the questions that you ask. There's three questions and Jonathan, what I'm going to do is I actually have a script on the exact question an accounting professional can ask when going through this conversation of how to raise your rates. I will share it freely with everybody that signed up for the webinar. Um, yeah, and, and Leela has a, a blog post that I'll, I will also share which is uh, questions ask a law firm when interviewing them. So we kind of put out a series of questions to ask. Yours will come, yours will be different than ours. Ours are really specific sure. about how to pull information out that helps you then present back what that attorney, what she may need from you and how you might present that. So that, that's a really helpful thing. So, um, when you're, so when you're having that conversation in your coaching experience, because you know, the, is that where you really do a lot of coaching is helping people have that conversation? Is that, is, is that where the, where people need the most work or is it the fear, the inertia that they have to get over? Is it the, Hey, we need to develop these processes because I can't have the conversation. Where is it that you focus or see the most work that you need to do with your clients to get them moving forward? Sure. But basically, I have a system and we go through the system um, and all of it is built around being able to value price your services as opposed to trading dollars for hours. The very first thing we do is we look at developing your niche with attorneys. You can be working with all attorneys or you might be just focusing on a particular segment of attorneys. It really is about what works best for you. And Jonathan could talk more about that in, in a moment. So, so figuring out who your niche is and, and who you really want to have that expert positioning with. Once we do that, then what I focus on is how, what's your system of helping your clients achieve that outcome that they want? What are the specific steps that you take them through so you can articulate it and they actually can visualize what it's like to work with you and how it's different from everybody else who calls themselves a bookkeeper. After that, we then productize your services. So we create packages, we bundle services together. Therefore, it's not doing a la carte, which is how so many traditional bookkeepers are set up in their business, but it's really about bundling the services that your different clients need. For example, Allison was saying that her clients vary from $3.99 a month to $5,000. Well, the clients that are at $3.99 a month need something a lot more scaled down, lean, and basic, whereas the ones that are at $5,000 a month need a more robust uh, package of services from her and, and that we would define what those different packages are. After that, we do pricing. So how do you price for value as opposed to trading dollars for hours? And then it's positioning. Where do you go out and connect with those ideal clients 
so they know that you exist, that you're the one that can help them solve that cash flow problem, take the bookkeeping off their hands, uh, but really manage their money so that they're positioned for growth and not um, having to really do it themselves or worrying about that. It lets them really focus on other parts of their business instead of that aspect, knowing that you're taking care of it, it's in good health. Um, and then the last part is you have to be able to have value conversations. And what does that flow look like? Uh, so it's, it's a whole progression of things. And throughout the whole process, Jonathan, there's going to be mindset issues because it's different selling someone else's services than it is your own. Uh, so really understanding the mindset part of it, looking at that strategy of what you want to achieve in your business and the tactical steps so that we can roll up our sleeves and get it done. Yeah, and I'm going to mention, mention one thing, not to put the cart before the horse, but the one thing I've seen um, as it relates to law when we think about what your offering is, um, one is, you know, of course there's the understanding of the law and the law firm, but really it's understanding the tools and picking a few that are your home run tools. As I showed in that screen, there's just a plethora of different tools out there, some good, some bad. And, and so there are some instances when you walk into a law firm that you have to adopt some architectures that are in place. I know some accounting pros that absolutely won't do that. When they get engaged with a law firm, part of it is they're typically the law firm financially a mess, meaning their workflows, and that they basically are looking to the pro advisor to say, clean it up. And so when they say clean it up, saying here's our preferred tools or stack of tools, you know, and that's a lien law, QuickBooks Online, a receipt bank. Um, it could be an invoice sherpa if it's a high retail practice. Um, you know, call box if they have some collection challenges. So there's a there's a host of tools that are sort of in the toolkit that are stitched together to create the workflows. And it's really cool because in Lima, you can, you know, tag a, an expense and receipt bank and all of a sudden that money you paid out is sitting in lien law tagged by the client and matter ready to be billed back to the client. And all the accounting is in QuickBooks because we're using QuickBooks as a conduit. So I think one is understanding the tools. Um, two is some of the productizations of the services. So, you know, there's the commodity of the bookkeeping, but then folks are looking for that trust reconciliation on a monthly basis. That's something that can be sold and the compliance that's related to it. Um, compensation reports is another piece. Um, as, you, as you get to those micro and larger firms, every month they have to do fairly elaborate compensation reports, but there's also staff utilization reports. There's um, accounts receivables reports. There's a lot of reporting that can be done to help that lawyer understand her practice or the firm's practice. Um, and then lastly, we're seeing outsourced invoicing because it's all virtualized, the ability that you can actually take it from approved invoice all the way through the, the receivable. Um, so when you bucket those four things together, that becomes this package that can be sold in from light to full based on whatever your girth is. But that's understanding sort of the, the components of a firm, but it all starts with knowing the firm and knowing some of the core tools of the firm. Um, we may have covered this, but I want to make sure that we did. Um, so. I want to really get specific on this and saying, how do you help um, clients raise their rates and get paid for what they're worth? I mean, I think it's that process, but I want you to, even if it's a little redundant, to go back to that and really hit that home because I think that's a really sure. important piece of this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the first thing is understanding who your ideal client is and understanding the value that you bring to the conversation. There's actually three different types of values. The primary one is those immediate values of how you make a difference for your clients. It might be improved cash flow, there might be forecasting, maybe you help stop money leaks in their uh, practice. So those are the primary, the obvious things that you do that are valuable to your client. And then there's the secondary. These are additional benefits that are possible because they chose to work with you versus someone else. Maybe the secondary is that now they have enough cash flow and better handle on their cash flow so they can hire more staff. It's possible that you sit down with them once a quarter to create a strategic plan for them to focus on working on their business over the next 90 days. Uh, maybe they are able to finally give themselves a raise or most important of all, what if they haven't taken a vacation for three years and that you've been able to help them 
get their business and their house in order in order so that they can actually finally take a vacation and recharge their batteries. So those are the secondary benefits. And the other thing is the hidden value. What is the cost of them not investing with you and continuing with that problem? It might be that by them not investing with you, this hidden value is they fail to recognize their most profitable source of income. Or it could be, and this just happened with one of my clients last week actually, is that they had money leaks because of credit card interest rates and we were able to actually plug that up, which was saving him now $500 a month in wow. those interest rates and credit card fees. Uh, or possibly looking at costly mistakes they're making that affect their profitability. They're doing something or there might be redundancies or there might be outstanding payments and ARs, but their collections aren't really that tight. And because of that, they're actually le leaking money out of their business and you're able to help uh, plug those up. So those are some of the things to look at as far as your value goes with your ideal clients is the primary, the secondary, and the hidden benefits. The next thing you want to really look at is packaging your services. When you're shifting from hourly rate where you're doing a lot of a la carte versus uh, value-based where it's a set fee that they know exactly how much they're going to be uh, paying you for your services on a regular basis, you actually want to create three options for them to be able to work with you. This way, it's not, not a yes or no decision about will I work with you or will I work with someone else? It now makes a decision, how will I work with you? The three bundles, the three options you wanna create is the silver, which is really the basic package, the most basic ones uh, for the most price sensitive clients. Then you want the gold, which is actually the package that the majority of your clients go into. And then there's a diamond package, which is the VIP. And those have additional features for a more robust, uh, more stabilized business that you're working with. So how do you start to package your services really to be able to accommodate the different needs of your various clients? After we do that, we talk about the value conversation. And a lot of times the value conversation is counterintuitive because I have what I call the 70-30 rule. The 70-30 rule is that you want your potential client talking 70% of the time during your engagement conversation, and you're doing 30% of the conversation. What would you be talking about then? Well, you're going to be asking great questions. And the questions have to do with them really looking at the money part. How much is this costing them? How much could they potentially uh, increase their revenue if they're working with you. You don't want to just have them increase their revenue. How do they increase their profitability also? So you really want to ask them questions around money to, uh, to start the conversation. And then you want to talk about the things about the emotional toll of continuing to live with this problem, the overwhelm, not knowing what to focus on, having too much on their plate and not sure about what to keep and what to get rid of. Uh, you want to really get into that emotional part because they're going to get that connection and rapport with you based upon emotion, and that's going to affect their decision to work with you or not. Then the next thing you want to really look at is the ways it affects other parts of their life because when things aren't going well in their business, it's not like they close the door at 5 o'clock and they're able to just focus on their personal life. That comes home with them, and because things might be off in their business, it might be that they're not taking care of their bodies as well, or they're losing sleep at night, or maybe they're not spending as much time with their family as they would be when things are going well. And to recognize that, yes, there's a price to pay that goes beyond business into their personal, their spiritual, their emotional health when things are a little bit off and that you can help them really rectify that as well. So those are the three categories of questions that you want to ask when you have a value conversation. And then the last part about how to raise your rates is when you're in that engagement conversation, you want to ask them, is, you know, is this something that you want to do? Are you interested in doing this? And help them to be able to make that decision that is in their best interest, as opposed to making a decision that might be in your best interest. But really ask them to make that next step with you if they're an ideal client, and then talk about the rates talk about the packages and how to be able to 
get started with that. Yeah, and I will tell you from my experience with attorneys in particular is that money typically, not in all instances, is not the objection. They'll gladly pay more for a service they value, for a individual they respect. The money issue that, oh, you know, Sarah charges X and David charges Y, I'm gonna go with David because he's 10% less. They don't care in the general because they're billing their time out on an average of 250 to $350. And so they understand the value of an hour of their own time. And so I really want you to not be to be cautious about you know thinking about the value of your dollar because an attorney that is really nitpicky about a dollar you know a hundred dollars here or a hundred dollars too is probably not a good client and it's probably has symptomatic problems inside their 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 business in many different ways and could be very challenging down road when we see this in lean law that you know people look at our pricing and know we're not the most expensive product but it price is not what drives a decision of adoption for a law firm. It's fit, intellect, how you help them get from where do you where they are today to where they go, where they're going. So um, we're we're creeping, and I'm I'm distracting us. Um, so I want to get to this question. Um, she, Lauren, and I were prepping for this, and I thought it was just a fabulous question, which is, why is the billable hour unfair to you and your client? Well. I would love to see if anybody wants to post in the chat why they think the billable hour might be unfair to them as well as to their clients. Would love to hear what uh, people are thinking about that because it's not what you typically hear. Uh, people say that they want to charge by the hour because it's fair. It then has, uh, they're treating all clients differently regardless of what size business someone has. Uh, and just interesting what, okay, so it doesn't encourage uh, efficiency is what Kerry was saying. Excellent. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts about why the billable hour is unfair? I do. <laughs> and I'm a speaker, so I'm supposed to. We're, we're going to hold off on your answer. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I absolutely agree with uh, Kerry. Uh, Devin says that it's completely arbitrary. My, what might take me one hour one day might take three hours another day. So you're absolutely right with that also, especially as you gain expertise or technology improves. What used to take you maybe uh, a whole day might now just take an hour. Uh, it's Gary saying it's counterproductive to results. It might only take a few minutes to get the result based on using technology. Totally. Absolutely right. Right, and the result is what's critical. You, you should not be penalized because you know how to operate the technology. Uh, let, let's just go there. Uh, the, the bottom line, what I see is that it pits you against your client. The, when you charge by the hour, they want you to work as quickly as possible to have it cost as little as possible. And you want it to take as long as possible so that you can make the most profit from it. So right there, it pits you against your clients. As uh, some of the people have mentioned, it actually discourages efficiency. When you charge by the hour, you make more money the longer something takes. So it doesn't encourage you to become more efficient or even effective at that thing that you do. Think about how many bookkeepers you know that are still doing something the old way, even though there might be technology available to uh, make it faster or more intuitive. Uh, and that if you're taking advantage of technology, you ought to be rewarded for it, not penalized. Uh, the Oh, okay. Allison saying, I hate the billable hour, moved away from it. Clients can't budget and can't be shocked and can be shocked at their bill. Additionally, I should work smarter with technology. So I'm in agreement with everybody. I believe that you guys covered almost all the points of how it pits you against your clients. Uh, but specifically, as you are working with a client more, you gain expertise in your particular niche, you're becoming more effective at what you do you actually would make less than when you first started out and you're still figuring things out or the technology wasn't uh, created yet. So you ought to be compensated for that uh, additional resources of intellect and what you know, as opposed to being penalized because you're getting to be more effective as well as more efficient. Uh, that, and also, as was mentioned, at the end of the month, people don't want to get surprises as to how much it's 
you charge them for your services. By the time the services are done, the value of what you just did has gone down. It's similar to driving a brand new car off the lot. As soon as you take possession and drive it off the lot, it has devalued significantly. And that's true with your services. Your highest value is before you actually start doing the work as opposed to after the work is done. And I want you to be well compensated for the problems you solve for your clients. And that's why I think value pricing is absolutely the way to go. And it's something that is done over and over again in all industries. Think about FedEx. If you have to get a package somewhere by tomorrow, you're gonna to pay triple if not quadruple to overnight it as opposed to having it go by ground. So when you can give something faster or there's urgency to get it done quicker, you ought to be well compensated for getting it done faster as opposed to having it be a long drawn out process. Yeah, and I don't, and I think that part of that's in related to subject matter expertise. So I agree with the entire group and I think the way I would phrase it is that there's this, you don't want to put financial, a financial tension on micro interactions with people, right? So lawyers have the same problem and they understand this, that, that you know, someone refrains from calling the lawyer, goes to Google it, comes back with an answer, maybe does some actions, something goes south, then the lawyer gets a mess. Had they just talked to the lawyer in advance, the lawyer would have given them the guidance to better prepare for the conversation. And I know this happens in the accounting community as well. People Google something because they don't want to call the, the, the accounting person and all of a sudden, um, you know, they did something in QuickBooks and now it's a mess and you've got to go clean it up. But I think the important piece here is all of what is said, but one other issue, one other issue is that lawyers in particular respect you if you can meet them where they're at and that you can be at their level of sophistication relative to their business. And what I mean by that is when they see you as an equal, when they see you as someone that can add value, can help them get through all these three different, you know, the immediate, the secondary, and the hidden, can work through and begin to reveal that. The relationship changes to be a trusted advisor. You're now having an intimate conversation and the money becomes secondary. It becomes a pleasure to pay you. I really mean that. I know that sounds crazy, but it becomes a pleasure to have you as part of their team. And that's the way they'll see it as part of their team because you're someone who's helping them get from A to B. But that only comes when you have the confidence and the know-how to speak with them on a fairly equal level. You don't know the law, but you know the accounting. They know law, but they don't necessarily know accounting, although some of them will think that they did. And that's what I found in my personal activity in selling lean law, is that when I became versed in their language and their operational tactics, I was able to say things and have conversations that were very frank, and they were receptive to it because they saw me as an expert and saw me as an equal. And I think that's really particular about this client base in particular. If a lawyer is looking for the commoditization of bookkeeping, they're not a good client. Mm -hmm. They're just not. If they're looking for someone who can help them move from where they are to where they're going to debuff all of the, what I call the, you know, the institutionalized worst practices to undo those, um, that's when the relationship rises out of the workflows and the data and actually it's a conversation between two people and you're helping them get to somewhere. That's to me the real core value. So that's gonna segue into my next question. Um, so, you know, Lauren, from a lawyer's perspective, and I know I have a lot of that expertise, what are the top four things that, that you know, she's going to value? What do you see that as what she, she's going to value? Mm -hmm. uh, from my research, there's four top things that your clients are going to highly value. They want to know that it's going to be easy, that it's going to be done quickly and well, that it's going to save them money and it's going to make them money. And I'd like to just expand upon that. So how is it going to be easy? Well, it's going to be easy because they don't have to do it or they don't have to hire someone in-house to do that for them. All they had to do is give you the appropriate access, have you set up their QBO and get them started, and you take that off their plates for them. How is it going to be fast? Well, they don't have to learn how to use QBO and the, its robust platform. You already are the expert in that. 
and you can actually guide them through the most important pieces that they need to know in order to have accurate information and accurate reports. How is it going to save them money? It's going to save them money because they're not going to make some costly mistakes that might happen if they were doing the books themselves or if they use someone that really wasn't an expert in their particular niche working with attorneys. Uh, because you do it all day, every day, you know some of the problems that attorneys encounter and you can help them navigate through that quickly because you're able to foresee or forecast some things that they might not be aware of or someone who doesn't niche in attorneys wouldn't be aware of either. And how does it make them money? Well, it frees them up from thinking about the getting their books done correctly, knowing what their cash flow is, to be able to do their work. It lets them work in their business or even on their business because you can help them forecast, you can help them with their cash flow in order to maybe bring on new staff that they need or to plug up mon money leaks. And the bottom line is they don't have to do it themselves. They have you on their team doing it for them and it gives them peace of mind. So once again, they want it to be easy, quick, save them money and make them money. I'm gonna add a few things on that. Mm -hmm. so, and this is from my experience. It's not just about a money conversation. I wanna be clear about that. We kind of get caught up in the ones and zeros of dollars and cents, but it's also about, and I'm sorry, but this is now the world that I'm seeing the accounting community come into. It's a bit about employee utilization. Because in the law firms, they're still using that billable hours of commodity. And I remember seeing Gail speak at Scaling New Heights. I can't remember her last name. She's a accounting, legal accounting professional out of uh, Washington. And she talked a lot about employee utilization and how the accounting firm can look at the numbers and say, are we utilizing the staff correctly? Right? Because the numbers speak to it and help explain to the attorney, hey, this staff member is underutilized, overutilized, not necessarily in the right position. A second example of this is that if the accounting workflow gets tighter and smoother and more automated, now you have someone inside the office who was doing these manual tasks, whether it's the attorney and they can do more work or more things in their community or more things with their family, or whether they have a staff member that now all of a sudden can go from, you know, manual work related to invoice processing to now project managing on a client. So you're taking someone you're taking manual tasks away and self, someone can be reutilized. Re and there's three areas, and I wanted to hit this point that an, a law firm kind of looks at, whether it's a, a larger firm or whether it's someone's own individual solo practice. The first lens or things that they look at is the practice in general. Those are, the, those are cash flows and P&Ls and things of that nature. How are we financially doing? The second is how is my staff doing? And that's employee utilization. You know, are they productive? Am I, you know, are they working for me? And the third is, how are my clients? Am I collecting my money? Is it profitable? And those are the three general areas that they dig into. And it's your opportunity, not job, opportunity to help them understand the dynamics of each three. No, you can't tell an attorney that's a good client in terms of what they seek in joy and passion. They may have pro bono work or something that's very unprofitable, but brings them joy and purpose. But you can look at clients and say, hey, when I look at this practice area, I see that you're just killing it. You've got good trust accounting. You get paid quickly. When I look at this practice area, I feel like you're, you're just losing your tail. And that's an opportunity for you to come in and help do that. Lean Law has these reports, all these tools do in a certain degree. But the attorneys at times don't take, make the effort to take the data and pull it out. So we've got six minutes left, um, and I hope we've we've um, are answering the questions. I know there's some. If we didn't answer it live, um, Lauren and I will answer it afterwards. Um, there's two questions I want to get at, Lauren. Since we have six minutes, I'm going to bundle them together. Um, one is, what are the actions um, action steps that you do? And I think you spoke to that, but I really want to be really explicit and go back to it, like. What is the next step? So we, we talked at a fairly high level with some specifics about what they can do. What do these folks do to really begin to overcome the inertia, deal with the fear, and not to suggest, I'm generalizing, of course, to the group, but to move forward and to shift and place themselves in a position where they 
our pricing from a value that they're becoming a trusted advisor. We all know this is where the industry is going. How do you, what's the next step? What's the one thing they can walk away from here? And the second piece, because it was asked specifically, again, just hint back on your coaching and how you help people. You get your sure. plug. Uh, what I would say is you've earned the right to raise your fees. Let's just go there. It's definitely about mindset and being able to reframe how you look at something. When you want to be able to raise your fees with your client, first you have to communicate it. What I suggest is writing a client-centered email or letter that explains your business model is changing and how it benefits them. Uh, I can go more into that on another time. We don't have enough time, but really write a client-centered email or letter about how it is going to benefit them. The next thing you want to do after you send them that uh, written information about the fact that your business model is changing, you want to schedule a conversation. Depending on your business, you do it either in person, by phone, by Zoom, whatever modality you tend to work best in with your particular clients. So, so you have that client conversation. Once you have that scheduled, then you have a value conversation which focuses on their needs and wants, uh, helps them to di uh, define some of the KPIs, the metrics. What is it worth to them? Those are some of the things you want to look at. Offer your three options of how they can move forward with you. After that, uh, you really want to explain what your packages are and how they work because it's a little bit of a different model than when you were charging by the hour. Uh, part of what this does is really positions you as a trusted advisor. And when you're showing them how to work with you, once again, stay in that trusted advisor mindset about you want to help them make the decision that's in their best interest as opposed to you, yours. Uh, recognize that there will be some objections. Get ready for them. Don't let them throw you off. Know what those uh, top objections are going to be and be prepared for how you want to answer them in order to really remain in that trusted advisory role. And then when those objections come up, confidently respond to them. Stay your ground. Don't close the conversation. Don't cave in to that objection because you feel like you're getting pushed back once again, it reinforces the value that you bring and that you are a trusted advisor. Uh, if this is something that we spoke about that resonates with you, you really see how this works for you, you would like to find out how to really bring this more into your business with uh, creating your niche, being able to know what your system is, looking at how to package, price, and promote your services and have those value conversations. That, that is what I do with bookkeepers and accounting professionals is I help them make that shift in their business model so that they have a business where they are the expert. It's based around the value that you bring to the table and that you get to cherry pick your clients. If that's something that interests you, then you're more than welcome to have a conversation with me um, offering, actually I put aside time for three complimentary uh, strategy sessions where we are going to look at where your business is now where you would like it to be, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities available as well, and whether it would be a good fit to work together. Uh, so if that's something that interests you, you are someone who is ready to really invest in your business and you know that you are the best investment you can make of time, money, or resources, I would love to have that conversation with you. You can find that at businesssuccesssolution.com forward slash let's talk. And I will go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Okay, I've got a little, a few, two last things from my side and then we're gonna end it. Um, I'm gonna launch a quick poll, which is um, just a little feedback on how you rated us on a one to 10 and what you thought of this webinar. So that's important if you could just take a few seconds and, and just give us that feedback. We would appreciate it. Um, and there's a secondary question there. So I'm gonna put the, close the poll in a second. Okay, finally seeing some coming in. And if, if you thought it could be better, we really would like to hear your feedback. So feel free to email me directly. I'm on the, on the um, list. The last thing I want to do, I'm going to share my screen real quick and talk a little bit about Lean Law and what some next steps are for what you can do with us. So I'm going to pop up my website. Um, one, we have a Lean Law Accounting Pro program. This is our effort to create community 
um, to network, to share referrals, to learn, to grow together. This has been wildly successful. Um, one of the key components is referrals. We need folks to be in this program so we can refer clients. Um, and, and of course, I'd be lying if we didn't want to have your referrals back to us. But we work as a team to work with these legal clients and bring them on. Um, that referral that I'm speaking to, each person gets a lien law page. Um, Allison was actually on this uh, service, and you can see that if we, if we click into her page, well, I won't take the time with me, but each person has their own page now, and it's kind of like a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, but it's an ability for you to talk to a law client via this um, Lean Law Accounting Pro referral, and this is getting used. Um, three, we have a blog series specifically for accounting where you'll see that we will have a third part to this series with Lauren um, in the weeks to come, and you'll all be emailed about that. So this blog post is another area to learn within the Lean Law Accounting Pro program. And then we have, um, this is that specific blog post I was asking that I'll share with the group and I'll just send it through the chat right now. So you, those are the questions to ask. And here's that three part that we're gonna be doing. Um, we're on number two, which is successfully raise your rates. But last, uh, the last one we'll do, and I don't know that we've picked a date yet, but it will be probably within six to eight weeks, is how to create um, an irresistible package. So Lauren and I have been doing this and uh, it's only getting better. So I really encourage you to be part of our program. There's no cost to you. You get a free version of Lean Law. Um, you can use it as a sandbox to learn how to use the application. You can use it to bill your own time, um, whether that's value-based and fixed fees or whether it's hourly or some of both. Um, and of course, if you ever get invited into a Lean Law firm, there's no cost there as well. Um, so I encourage you all to become a pro. Lauren, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. I thank you. I thank you all to the guests uh, who attended and participated and um, have a great afternoon.